Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to First Five Live, a Freedom Forum conversation series featuring activists and influencers who share their stories about how they have exercised the five freedoms of the First Amendment to ignite change. The goal of First Five Live is to provide differing perspectives and to reach a broad and diverse audience to help people understand and value the powerful role the First Amendment plays in our lives. The Freedom Forum is one of the nation's largest foundations focused on First Amendment issues. Our mission is to foster First Amendment freedoms for all through education, advocacy, and action. We hope you enjoy the program. Thank you, Jan, and welcome to First Five Live. I'm John Maynard, Senior Director of Programs for the Freedom Forum and your moderator for our program. We are joined by SC Cup, host of CNN's SC Cup Unfiltered, which covers the intersection of politics and media. She is also a political commentator for CNN, which she joined as a contributor in 2013. She's also a nationally syndicated political columnist, culture critic, and author, and writes regularly for the New York Daily News, Glamour, and CNN.com. She is also the author of Losing Our Religion, The Liberal Media's Attack on Christianity, and co-author of Why You're Wrong About the Right. SC Cup, welcome to First Five Live. Thanks, John, and thanks, Jan. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Um, for our virtual audience, uh, you are welcome to send your questions to SE using the Q&A button um, at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get, try to get to those at the end of the program. SE, um, as Jen said in the opening, um, First Five Live is really a deep dive into the First Amendment. And um, as a columnist, political commentator, and a TV host with a, a strong social media presence and a following, uh, you clearly are using your First Amendment rights on a, on a daily basis. So how does, how does the First Amendment guide your work? Uh, it is my work, right? It, it, not only am I a writer and a, and a columnist, I am an opinion right. columnist and an opinion writer and an opinion host, which means guarding my right to say what I believe is the whole, it's the whole ballgame for me. It's, it's everything. And uh, I've been lucky over the 20 years of my, of my media career that no one's ever told me, you can't say that, mm -hmm. or you can't write that. And I've written and worked everywhere. I've, I've written for conservative publications, liberal publications. I've worked at right-leaning news organizations, left-leaning, all, you know, runs the gamut. Right. And I've never had an editor or producer or anyone say you can't say or write that. That's why I do this. And that's, that's the, the, the fiber of my being as a person and a journalist that allows me to do what I do. We, we can take for granted here that having an opinion and sharing it is um, a right. And, and it is, and we're lucky. That's not the case everywhere. Right. And so I, I think about that every day because, because I'm not just you know, opining on some, some soft stuff. I'm opining on real serious stuff. I, I, I call out the president. I call out institutions of power. That's very dangerous to do right. in countries where that's not really protected. Right. You, you mentioned 20 years you've been, you've been kind of doing this. When did you discover the importance of the First Amendment? Was it growing up? Was it when you got into the, into the business? Yeah, a couple, a couple things I remember. Because um, I didn't grow up with like activist parents who talked mm -hmm. about this stuff all the time. But I did grow up in the 80s. And as a child of the 80s, you know, the Cold War and um, communism was, was in the ether and happening around me. And I remember being less compelled by the awfulness of, you know, bread lines as I was the awful idea that the government could prohibit you from saying stuff. Mm. That really kind of was, was jarring as a kid to confront that yeah. uh, in sort of the kid, kid way that I, that I did at the time. And then a little later, the Tipper Gore... <laughs> music yes. debate, 
mm-hmm. happened. And that was a very public national conversation about um, controversial songs and how parents can protect their kids from hearing these songs. And what we ended up with, you know, parental advisories is fine. But over the course of that debate, censorship was kind of looming large over it. And I just remember as young as I was thinking, well, I don't know, I don't listen to a lot of these songs, but I don't think this is the right side of this argument. Mm -hmm. And then another just memory that stuck with me was the Dan Quayle Murphy Brown story. Mm -hmm. And that was mostly about sort of morality and the way, yeah, and feminism and the way single motherhood was was um, projected in popular entertainment. But for me, it was also very much about censorship and what you're allowed to say and some ideas being subversive. And so those, I mean, those are just and just getting back to the moments from, you know, say it again. For our younger, younger audience members, maybe give a primer on the, the Dan Quayle, Murphy Brown, what happened there, Dan Quayle. Well, Murphy Brown was this high powered yep. journalist. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, no surprise, I loved that show. Yeah. But um, she was, you know, getting into her, I'm sure then 30s, but you know, for all intents and purposes, 40s, you know, when your life shuts down apparently as a woman. And she wasn't married and she wanted to have a kid. And so she had a kid out of wedlock and really celebrated that decision to be a working mom. And I guess that was radical at the time. Mm -hmm. And Dan Quayle thought it was really unseemly to celebrate that on, you know, a sitcom on network television. And so there was this big national debate. I mean, that story was on the front page of the New York Times. I remember it. Absolutely. And uh, I just... I just remember feeling viscerally, why are you even asking whether someone could show this? I mean, it just, uh, it bothered me. Yeah. And, you know, I say that as a, as a conservative, it bothered me. Yeah. So those are just snippets of, you know, pop culture moments that stuck with me. It wasn't until I was like, probably in college and then in journalism that I really thought about, you know, the political implications of, of free speech and a free press and what that all meant really. Uh, I just knew like internally that um, free speech was was really important. Right. Um, the, the First Amendment does seem deeply misunderstood um, these days. The Freedom Forum has done surveys on that, that show there are a lot of misconceptions. Um, why do you think that might be and, and how do we increase the understanding of the, of the value of these freedoms? Yeah, it's funny because I'll I'll use another example, freedom of religion. Mm-hmm. Freedom of religion is often misinterpreted, even among liberals, as freedom from religion. And it's partly that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the separation of church and state is partly about keeping the government from foisting a state religion on you. But it's most importantly, the ability to celebrate and worship publicly without fear of retribution, without fear of being persecuted. Freedom of speech is um, misunderstood in a very similar way sometimes, Mm -hmm. that freedom of speech is really freedom from speech, and that you're meant to be protected from offensive speech. And look, the lines are not always clear. It's why we have national debates and conversations about what this amendment means. Mm -hmm. But I think what it comes down to, like so many other things, is is a better understanding of civics when we're kids. I mean, you can't get to people when their opinions are already formed. I think you really have to um, implore young people to understand basic civics why our founding fathers, not who our founding fathers were, but why they cobbled together these institutions, why they decided freedom of religion and freedom of the press and freedom of speech, why these things were important and what they were meant to do. And I just don't, I don't know that that happens uh, most effectively. Right. 
I'm glad you brought up freedom of religion because in your book, which came out about 10 years ago, um, Losing Your Religion, you wrote about the media's attack on Christianity. Tell us a little bit more about the book, um, how the role of, of the right of freedom of religion played in, in writing that book. And, and I don't want to throw too many things at you, but yeah. have your views changed since writing that book? Uh, you know? No, so I'm, I'm an atheist. Um, I and have been for as long as I can remember and not without exploring. Um, I went to religious schools. I got a master's degree in, in faith studies. So it, I, I didn't just decide as like an angsty teenager <laughs> to be an atheist and then never considered it again. I, I um, took a lot of care with that. And as someone outside of faith, I noticed that people of faith were not always treated very respectfully uh, by the press. And that manifested in many, many ways. One, not a lot of uh, people of faith in newsrooms. You just, it's a very secular institution and maybe by design, maybe by default, not really sure. Um, the media can be condescending toward people of faith. And let's not forget um, people of faith account for a vast majority of people in this country. Voters are, are generally of faith. And that doesn't mean they get special attention, but it, sh it certainly doesn't mean they should be condescended to, mocked. And I came across a lot of these examples. I mean, one that just comes to mind, and there were hundreds in this book. Uh, I remember in, in 2008, um, Chris Matthews, MSNBC host at the time, thought it was really funny that Sarah Palin admitted she prayed on big decisions, like, like about 80% of the country, right? Like that's not an abnormal thing to admit. He thought it was really weird and kind of kooky. And look, politics comes into play sometimes when we talk about religion and religion is used and abused by both sides when you're talking about politics. But I just saw a lot of these examples. And I thought, again, uh, you know, Christians in America don't need uh, uh, to be special class citizens, but I think they should be treated like everyone else and not, you know, not mocked. And so I thought it was important as an atheist, someone outside of faith, to hold the media accountable where it was, I think, doing um, news consumers a disservice. News consumers who might be religious, by the way. Um, and again, the book goes through lots of examples from the way people talk about religious businesses and religious films and religious entertainment to politics and the way it handles, um, you know, Christians on the left versus Christians on the right. Just a lot of what I thought were hypocrisies. Mm -hmm. I don't know that much of that has been righted. Mm -hmm. Um, since then, and in fact, I think the conversations have, have only been hurt because, like so many other things in media, we don't have a religion beat at most major newspapers anymore. We used to. That used to be a, a really important part of major newspapers to have someone on the religion beat, and we just don't have, that's going away mm -hmm. with cuts and everything. So I'm not sure we're doing a better job talking about religion in a country that is religious. Right. Um, I want to get to one more First Amendment type question. And it, uh, earlier this summer, uh, Donald Trump tweeted, um, it is a shame that Congress doesn't do something about the lowlifes that burn the American flag. It should be stopped. And now uh, you responded to that tweet. Mr. President, come on down. I'd like you to meet the First Amendment. So that's a good, great example of what you were saying earlier of how the First Amendment does allow you to, to talk back. To the, to the president of the United States. What, what prompted that tweet, especially yeah. about the, the flag burning? Well, it's just so insane. I mean, it's ill-informed, it's ignorant, it's all those things, but also pretending you don't know anything about the Constitution, if that's your compass, that's where you come from internally, I just think that's really a, a very dangerous mindset. Now, as a defender of free speech, he's allowed to have it. You know, I'm not coming for him. But at the same time, uh, I think if that's your worldview, it's a real dangerous place to be. And especially coming from that podium, that platform to say, uh, you know, uh, there's this thing that I don't like, I find it offensive. And so you can't do it anymore. And maybe, 
you know, as the president putting my hand on the stove, it'll mean something more for me to say, these are terrible people. I mean, it's just awful. Yeah. It's awful. It's an abuse of the role. Um, let's talk a little bit about some current events. You know, we're currently living through a pandemic, economic upheaval. Uh, we've seen the fight for racial equality playing out in locations all over the country, in the world even. Um, as a commenter and a columnist, how, how, would, how would you categorize this period in, in our history? Well, to start, I mean, it's very disorienting. Um, you know, we've not experienced this sort of thing in, in like a generation uh, or, any, or anything close. Right. And maybe at the worst time, because we don't, you know, we don't have a cohesive leadership that's, I think, handling this very well. And so I think mistakes and circumstances are being compounded by abuses of power, corruption, all things we really don't need right now. And politics, and we've become so political. And everything is so tribal and down party lines and us versus them. And we're more uh, interested in identifying, you know, heretics than we are converts. And it's just conflating in this one very fraught moment. And, you know, it's hard to see an easy way out. Yeah. I know people think that come November, you know, some, somehow magically, with a vote, this will all right itself. And I think some of it will, <laughs> magically with a vote, but some of it won't. And we're gonna be dealing with some of the things that, ha that are happening right now, but also over the past few years for, for some time. Right. Uh, going to, to politics, you, your column, which just came out today, um, uh, you, you write that uh, Biden's selection of a vice president uh, is hugely important to you. And why don't you just expand on that and tell, tell us why? Well, listen, I'm, I'm a conservative, and it's taken me a bit to get to the place where I am contemplating voting for Joe Biden. That's how bad I think Trump is, because uh, he's not a conservative. That part's easy. And I didn't vote for him in 2016. I, I wrote someone in, which you could argue, you know, helped Trump, uh, essentially. But for me, I needed to sleep at night knowing that I didn't vote for him. Well, I'm not voting for Trump this year either. But I am very seriously considering voting for Joe Biden. I think it's that important, even though I'll, I'll disagree with Joe Biden on a number of things. But who he picks, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm good with Joe, but who he picks for his running mate, I think is vitally important. And I'm, I'm already getting a lot of heat for, for saying this. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Trump is that bad. Who cares who his running mate is? Well, I do. Mm -hmm. I care because look, Joe Biden's getting older and this person might be running the country. And we should ask all the questions of our leaders lest something like 2016 happen again. Mm -hmm. And so I don't take, I don't appreciate the criticism that I must vote this way or I don't really care and I'm not you know, on the right team. I'm gonna take this real seriously. And I wanna know what Joe Biden's running mate wants to do with the country. I think it's just as important as knowing what Trump wants to do. Mm -hmm. And so you can call that, you know, petty or partisan or whatever. I just think this is a really serious decision. I don't take it lightly. Right. And I'm not willing to just rubber stamp and say, voting for Joe, no matter who he puts on there. I'm not. Right. Right. Um, you know, certainly we all see Biden leading in the, in the major polls. Um, of course, Hillary Clinton had a major advantage uh, around four years ago at this time. What differences do you see in the state of the race as, uh, as opposed to four years ago? I don't see a big difference. Yeah. I, I think it's real close and I think it's tighter than people um, are suggesting. I think Trump could still win. So I think it's very similar. In fact, I think Trump might have a better shot um, now, it's just hard to see. It's not because I don't trust polls, although that's part of it. It's just, I think a lot of what Trump does that turns people like me off, and certainly the left, really endears him mm -hmm. to a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. And those people aren't always talking about it. 
Right. And so you might not know just how many people really appreciate the things I consider horrible. Um, I think that's underrepresented right. and sometimes, um, you know, underappreciated. Yeah. I want to get to one of our questions for in this, this show that we do have some younger audience members here. Uh, great question for you. What are your recommendations for a student journalist who is interested in a TV career as a political anchor like yourself? What would I recommend, like how to do that? Or I suppose getting into the career, you know, getting on as a political anchor. Well, there's lots of ways to start, right? You can start in small markets and work your way up through, you know, mid markets, major markets. That's one sort of vertical trajectory. There are some people who are of the mind that you need to go out in the field, get a skill, and then you can come back to journalism and really write on and report on that area of interest because you know it intimately. Mm -hmm. And a criticism of some journalists is they don't do that. You know, they don't, some don't really go out and learn about something firsthand. They write about it from, you know, a desk. That's another route. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of the expertise route. So you go out and do counterterrorism and then come and write about it or do education and then come and write about it. Uh, another way is to write a book. Uh, that certainly, you know, jump starts any, any journalist's career. For that, you've got to have something to say and a lot of time and discipline and got to be good at, good at putting pen to paper and then hope that someone publishes. And look, I, 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 that's what I did. I, I worked in journalism and I wrote a book and I was not a known commodity and I had to send pitch letters to every literary agent on the face of the planet before I finally got one who accepted my manuscript and then you know, got, got us um, a deal at Simon & Schuster. I mean, that was incredibly lucky. Yeah. But that opened a lot of doors for me afterwards. Right. But there's lots of routes. Uh, the best, broadest advice I can give anyone going into this field, say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. Because it is sometimes as simple as saying, yeah, I'll work on Christmas at 2 a.m. <laughs> or, you know, yeah, I can be there in five minutes. Or yeah, I can file that right away. Sometimes it's that simple. Getting in the door is just being there, being available, being on time, being willing, being hungry. And some people think of this route to you know stardom or success as one where gradually all these obligations fall down and you get to just kind of focus on one big thing. And that happens for very few of us. What you really wanna be doing is saying yes all the time so you have all of these branches off this tree that you're growing so that when some branches die you have these others to go often you've laid this groundwork when you're young and hungry and energetic to keep this you know the fruits growing because they can die real quick when you're when you're not looking yep we are almost out of time time essie but um such a big story right now, of course, is, is schools and, and, the, and the pandemic and opening. And uh, a, a very recent column you wrote uh, in regards to schools, um, you say that for those schools that are reopening, you applaud uh, them for their implementing rigorous health yeah. and safety measures. But you also argue at what cost. Could you ex expand on that since it's such a story that is, is everyone's talking about in, in terms of schools? Well, I have a five and a half year old, and so he'll be going into kindergarten at the public school in the fall. And like you said, the protocols that I'm, I'm reading about from, from our town and other, many other towns, you know, like it, are rigorous, uh, you know, all day mask wearing, hourly hand washing, interactions through plexiglass, morning temperature taking, isolation rooms for kids who appear symptomatic. I mean, Stuff that sound to me like a dystopian hellscape, like well, I'd rather I'd rather keep my my kid home than put him through that every day. Um, you know, I I have that luxury. I know everyone doesn't. I understand how important it is to have schools open for working parents and for the economy, but I don't know that we're asking enough questions about our kids' psychological health mm -hmm. as we do this. Uh, you know, we certainly are talking about keeping them safe from COVID which is important, but what about safe from trauma, from you know, the psychological impact 
of going to school in this way. It's unprecedented. No one alive today has gone to school like that. So I'm working through that as a parent, like lots of other parents are, and I'm undecided. I'm not settled on what we're going to do, but I want to start having those conversations about about our kids' mental health, especially our little kids. Um, and what is worse, keeping them home or sending them if this is the, the environment they're going to be in? I want to, we've got one last question in and then I'll, I'm going to let you go. But um, the gentleman writes, you mentioned trust in polls. What are current journalists you trust or want to hear from? Um, he also adds, you are on my list of journalists I respect, along with Candy Crowley, Dana Bash, and Gloria Borger. So, but if you wanted to add to that, that question. All current or former CNNers, I appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. That. Yes, exactly. Um, and I, I love all three of those women as well. Uh, well, it, it depends. There, yeah. there are journalists who deal with polls, like Dana, like Gloria, like I do. Um, and then there are pollsters, right? And, and people who do the polling. And then there are sort of poll watchers. Um, Harry Enton at CNN is our numbers guy, and he looks at all the polls. He doesn't conduct the polls himself, but he's got a real good grasp of what all the polls mean and, and, and the kinds of questions people are asking. I think those people um, are undervalued and very, very important because I can't understand all the math and the stats and you know the, the methodology, but someone like Harry can break it down for reporters and, and hosts like me so that we can give you information in context, not just Trump is up, Biden's down, or Biden's up, Trump is down. Mm -hmm. It's important to have that context. But even with all of that, I still think polling is flawed. It's flawed because it's self-selective. It's flawed because it's not capturing um, huge swaths of, of voters, including young people, um, because they're not answering landlines at five o'clock in the middle of the day, you know? Mm -hmm. right. So I think that's something we should really work on overhauling if we want to start getting election predictions right again because right. um, right. we haven't been right. for, for a while yep and i'm gonna give you one more question it's a lightning round it's the last question from uh, from the uh, audience i want to make sure i got them all in but sure and i'll just read it verbatim how can one reconcile conservatives loud proclamations about the importance of freedom with their silence when trump calls the press the enemy of the people did you get I can't. I mean, yeah. and I don't. It's why okay. I don't consider yeah. him conservative. People who defend that don't sound conservative to me. And again, there's a difference between conservatives and Republicans, right? Republicans, part of the party, um, not necessarily conservative, as you can see. And I, I used to joke, and I think, John, I've said this to you at some event before, that President Trump wore the Republican Party like a rented tuxedo. Right? Anyone can put the party on. But to have the core beliefs of a conservative is a totally different thing. And so if you're defending the president's attack on the press, not for legitimate criticisms, we are not above reproach, um, but just as the enemy, because uh, we are critical of him, that's not cons that doesn't sound conservative to me. Uh, you know, that sounds authoritarian. Well, we are out of time now. Um, I, I do want to thank you, SE Cup, for, for joining us today on First Five Live and, and certainly for sharing your thoughts um, on the First Amendment as well as some of the current issues in the news. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for all the great work you guys do. And I, I was glad to be able to do it today. Appreciate that. Um, uh, for our audience, uh, we ask that you please join us on uh, Monday, August 17th at 2 p.m. when we talk to civil rights activist DeRay McKesson. Uh, we'll talk to him about how he uses his First Amendment rights to further his mission of promoting issues of innovation, equity, and justice. And as always, you can go to freedomforum.org for more information about all our initiatives and programs. Thank you once again for joining us on First Five Live. I'm John Maynard.